Built Better, the podcast for home improvement contractors by Modernize Home Services. Welcome to Built Better, a podcast made for home improvement professionals by Modernize Home Services. I'm your host, Don Pucci. On today's episode, we're welcoming VP of Sales and co-owner of Boca Walk-In Tubs, Dominic Telemundi, as he visited Modernize's Austin headquarters. Boca Walk-In Tubs manufactures premium walk-in tubs right here in the United States. They service 23 different locations across the country, and as you'll hear, they're growing rapidly. It was really great to meet Dom in Austin. It's always fun to meet another Dom, especially one that's growing and running a high, high growth business in the aging in place segment of the home improvement industry. In this episode, we had a chance to touch on his uh, approach to marketing, manufacturing, and supply chain, and how he's working with a growing dealer network, as well as the thriving culture he's helped to create in the era of the great resignation. As always, if you like the Built Better podcast, please help us out by subscribing on YouTube, ring the bell for notifications of new episodes, give us a like on Spotify or Apple. Without further ado, here's our conversation with Dominic Telemundi. Dom, thanks for being with us here today on Built Better. Really appreciate you coming down to Austin and giving us some love and some FaceTime. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so, Dom, you're the VP of sales um, and part owner. Co- three owners, yeah? Yeah, there's three of us. Three owners uh, for Boca Walk-In Tubs. Uh, I mean, that's, if our listeners don't know, the aging in place demographic is it's about to explode. So, yeah, for sure. Just from a market perspective, you guys are, are positioning yourselves in a, in a really growth market. So, just wanted to just start off and just kind of understand your story and where you came from, why you're in the walk-in tubs business, and then we'll we'll dive in a little bit deeper. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's a little odd. You don't grow mm-hmm. up thinking I'm going to sell walk-in tubs one day. Right. Um, so I was in the insurance business for years. I built up a successful team over there, and we were doing well with that. And my uncle had started Boca Walk-in Tubs back in 2008, and he was looking to retire, looking for somebody to kind of take it over. So I went in, looked at the business, saw a lot of potential there. Um, I put together some partners and we purchased the company from him back in 2019. And we've made a ton of changes since then. Um, My uncle didn't necessarily believe in the internet or uh, pictures or any kind of uh, thing in the new world like that. So we've had our work cut out for us. We've uh, spent a lot of time just creating collateral for our dealers and really trying to focus on the dealer program as a whole and provide a better support. Yeah. How many dealers do you have now in the 20s? Roughly about 23 dealers across yeah. the country. And w- when you took over the business, how many dealers did you, you start with? Probably about 10 or so. 10 so or so. We've, we've had to add dealers. We've had to uh, find good lead partners like y'all. And uh, it's been a journey. Yeah, I, I imagine so. 2019. So you saw you went through COVID, adding dealers, growing yeah. the business. Right. So a lot of things happened over the last three years. COVID was unique for us and for this uh, this market in general. Um, bathing in place or um, aging in place really took off and became much more popular. So although COVID was horrible for many people for many reasons, um, at least we have a product that kind of aids with um, staying at home and, and staying in your home. Right. That's a really good point, actually. I mean, yeah. you don't want to put your grandmother in a a nursing home if you don't have to no Especially yeah in a nursing home environment where you're gonna yeah they became very yeah. unpopular obviously right. during that period of time so um it really helped our product for sure and helped people that were using them yeah i mean an unfortunate situation but you know kind of like the zooms of the world there are industries that benefit from those types of situations so. for sure absolutely but it's not going to end there i mean we're getting out of covid pandemic going to yeah. an endemic, right? We're just going to deal with this stuff. I mean, kind of have to, right? For sure. So the industry itself is going to 5X over the next five years? Yeah. So we're in a unique place. Um, right now, the baby boomer generation is the largest in the United States. They actually hold 70% of the wealth as well. And as they are continuing to get older, it's just now that they're starting to need our products. So the next 25 years or so is going to be a heck of a run. Yeah, I'll say. I, uh, we've, we've spoken to a couple people in the aging in place just as, as an industry in a whole. And if I'm a contractor and, uh, I, 
can't say that I am, although I am a hobbyist at home, so I can paint and make some cabinets. <laughs> I just made my first square cabinet. Nice. There you go. <laughs> We're all on your way to having a home improvement show. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but I, you know, I give contractors a lot of credit for what they do. It's a really hard industry. It's you know, it's even harder from a marketing perspective. Yeah. I mean, for a manufacturer that also has to deal with signing dealers, getting their sales process in line with what your expectations are, tackling marketing, all the back end systems, call centers, all that good stuff. I mean, there's there's significant challenges. So, I mean, just what what do you think just from the first kind of drill in question, what, what's been kind of your secret to the the quick ramp up period that you've had with your dealers? 10 dealers to over 20, 3 years and that's that's a pretty meteoric rise. Uh it's definitely good partners. You, If you're going to go into business with others and have partners, you want to make sure you choose them wisely. So um, Bruce Hollinger um, as our CEO, Matt Dennis as our vice president of operations, um, it really gives me the freedom to do what I need to do on the sales and marketing end and building the dealers, um, knowing that I have the right people in the right places in order to take it to the next level. Um, but yeah, I mean, Part of the recipe for success is really just game planning, knowing who you want to be, being true to yourself, and um, not trying to tackle too much at one time. Um, so we're about to come out with walk-in showers. But before we launched that product, we really wanted to be the best at tubs that we could be. So we really spent time putting the focus on that and kind of being the master of that before we branched into anything else. Right, right. So what what would be the difference if I'm a if I'm a potential dealer? Yep. You know, what's your what's the difference between installing a walk in tub, a walk in shower, and how how does that factor into how you kind of communicate what the homeowner potentially would prefer in the, in those scenarios? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have some people who just love baths and prefer baths, and you have some people who've just been showering their whole lives and they're not going to go into a bath. Um, a lot of times people associate the tub with being safer. Um, it's a little more confined. You have more touch points and areas to grab. I, I'd say probably less of a chance of slipping just because of the fact that you're surrounded by solid materials that you can grab onto. Um, when it comes to the installation, it's all kind of the same. It's a same day install. Uh, we're creating these products to replace a current bath or shower in the wet space we manufacture all of the materials to fill in that space so when the job is done it's going to look like it was designed with the home it's not going to stand out in a way where you recognize that it's new to that space um, we try to make everything custom to fit right on the spot and they're able to do it within four to six hours installing a tub on average i mean that's pretty rare to find a product in in this type of industry i mean windows maybe yep. right hvac plumbing maybe a wa hot water heater but most jobs are going to be extended out quite a bit right yeah so do you deal with any current like supply chain issues uh, even with the one day installed do you have like a backlog that you're kind of dealing with as a challenge yeah, I mean, we saw a lot of this coming. Um, we do pay attention to the markets quite a bit and paying attention to what's going on in the world. We made a decision to invest heavily into our um, into our products that could have been backlogged. So at our factory, it's kind of funny right now, everything's stacked up because we have months and months and months supply ready to go so that we don't slow down our dealers. Um, our dealers, it's a true partnership, so... Um, they need to be able to deliver to the customer with a promise and we need to be able to deliver that product. Right. So yep. at what point do you deplete your reserves and then reorder? Like where do you get to? You, you know, we, we've, uh, we've kind of just been playing it by ear. Um, we feel like right now, like a three month, uh, backlog is a good idea for us. Um, typically if you're going to have a supply constraint, you're usually backed up by an extra month or so. So we just try to take it one step further and actually two steps further and have that extra space. But yeah, we're just doing everything we can, like many businesses, just trying to be creative, um, you know, navigating through COVID now, post COVID now supply constraints and shipping and things like that. Luckily for us, though, we manufacture in the United States, and the parts and things we're sourcing come from the United States. So 
it does make that much easier. Yeah. One of the th- piece of news items that's always out there, right, is the great resignation. Yeah. The, the shortage of um, just labor in general, especially, you know, a labor that you would need in manufacturing. Yeah. Right. Does that hit you at all? Or what are your strategies? You've done your homework. You've got some good questions here. Um, yeah. So we were hit with some of that as well. Um, hiring has been a challenge. Um, one way to do that better is to pay more. So we've certainly been paying a lot more to get the right people in place. But I have to say on the flip side of that, that was another, I hate to say benefit of COVID, but when places were laying off and our business was doing better, we were able to pick up key employees that we might not have been able to get before. Um, key skill labor that we were able to pick up at their existing pay schedule or greater. And now they're a part of the Boca team and we've kind of cemented them and they're staying. Um, But yeah, we, we were able to add some amazing people to our staff, like mold makers and just people that you really need as a, as a fiberglass manufacturer. Right. Right. That's the backbone of your business. Yep. Yeah. You know, we saw kind of the similar thing with, with our business We've got we've got job openings and we we fill them pretty quick, especially in our you know account management and sales staff, which I uh, you know have a key uh, responsibility into. Right, if you treat your people right, yep. if you pay them well, right, there's a there's a limit to that. You know, there's a give and take, of course. Uh, it's a lot about the just the just the way that you treat your people like humans. Yep, it's just so surprising to me. I mean, just as a person that manages people, just like the stories that I hear from some of the folks I've hired lately. It's yeah. I don't understand, you know. I think this is a, a new thing anyway. Just um, the way, like, your business is set up, the culture you guys have here, it's it's awesome. It's contagious. Uh, we try to do the same thing. We're a family back at our factory. We um, eat together once a month, our, our entire factory workers. In fact, I just uh, ordered the food before I came here, so we're doing, like, Chinese food on Friday. But, oh, nice. you know, we'll, we'll all eat together, um, you know, Christmas, other holidays. We we try to hang out, and we have their kids come, our kids come. So everybody intermingles. And I think that it's really important because you spend a lot of time at work, and it's got to be something that you look forward to, not something that you're trying to work Monday through Friday and live for the weekend. That's no life at all. So um, the risk of sounding infomercially, let's call it, I want to understand if I'm somebody that's looking to get into walking tubs as a dealer. Yeah. Like what's your pitch? What's your elevator pitch? Like lay it on me. I want to, I want to work for you. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the dealers that we're signing already have experience in this area. Um, A lot of times they're working for one of our competitors, maybe one of our larger competitors, and they recognize that they could potentially be selling these tubs at a lower price and actually profiting more as a dealer than they do as a salesperson. So I've, I've heard it from some of them that it's kind of, um, you know, they're selling it for a while and they know they're selling it at this high price and they know that they could be selling it lower and it kind of eats at morality a little bit. And then of course, you know, everybody's working to provide for their family or whatever their end goal is. So uh, making a little more money and selling a product for less and it's a high quality product. It kind of just is a good, good for everybody. Right. High quality products, better margins, right? From a marketing perspective, it's one of the things that you know I know a little bit about working yeah. for a marketing company. When you carry a higher margin, marketing isn't always uh, working, right? You know, which we'll is put it on the table, right? You're gonna have bad months. Oh, yeah. I have a couple bad months, right? So if you have a little higher margins, you know, you can sustain a little higher marketing costs in those in those times, right? Is that something sure. that factors into your conversations with your dealers? Yeah, I mean, you have to look at it from a number standpoint. And, you know, the dealers need to profit a certain amount in order for it to make sense. If the margins are too thin, then it just isn't going to work in a customer service aspect. Just any of it, it'll all fall apart. So uh, what we teach the dealers, especially with our marketing partners, is that, you know, take a look at your overall spend. Take a look at your overall sales. uh, What is your acquisition cost? And then look at that and bake that into your price so that it works out and, you know, just simple economics. But um, 
it is it is weird in sales. When you're doing well, it feels like you'll never do bad again. And when you're doing bad, it feels like you'll never do well again. Um, so it is important to just uh, take your emotions out of it and look at the numbers. Yeah, it's, from experience, it's, it really is hard to not be emotional, especially if that's your lifeblood, right? Yeah. I always tell people, if you're running a big organization, it's easier mm. to be just looking at numbers on a spreadsheet. Yep. If you're running a smaller business and if you're a dealer, right, and you are the guy, that's uh, that's your checkbook, you know? That's your, I can take my take my kids out and do what they want to do and yeah. send them to camp this year, right? You know, all those good things, right? So it's, that is a hard proposition, right? Another thing that's underrated is momentum. Um, the power of momentum is huge. And when you have it, you have to harness it. Um, I find a lot of times some of my dealers that I've seen and just different things in my past experience. Um, when things are going well, people start to take their hands off the steering wheel and they start to become more lifestyle oriented. And then they'll reach a crunch point and all of a sudden now their back's against the wall and they're trying to rebuild. But I think it's just very important to not forget the little things that made you successful in the beginning and then to maintain those things consistently. And consistency is the key. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. Right. Yeah. One of the best things I did was uh, screw up my credit back in the day. Mm, okay. Honestly, it sounds weird to say that, right? But w- coming out of college. A lot of people do. <laughs> I mean, they don't teach it in, they don't teach it in high school. Yeah. You don't you, you take a. You know, pre-calc, but when do you, when's the last time you use pre-calc, right? I swipe my credit card every day. Yeah. You know, I have to pay my mortgage every month. There's a lot of things, budgeting, planning, you just don't get that experience. Financial literacy. Right. You read a lot about that, like Robert Kiyosaki, yeah. great author, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, awesome book. Yeah. The best thing I personally did beyond reading anything about finance was screw it up and then figure out how to build it back. There you go. Um, so in a weird way, that was kind of a good learning tool for me. Yeah. Obviously you got to impart that wisdom on people. To not be, you know what? Screw up your credit and uh, yeah, go do that. Right. Or, you know, I'd like my, I have children and I'm teaching them, you know, not to do that. Yeah. Um, but I have them like all as authorized users on my credit card. I have a stepdaughter who just turned 18 years mm-hmm. old and um, you know, she was able to apply for a credit card and then got a $5,000 limit because yeah. she's been on as an authorized user on my card for years. So I'm, right. I have her right now, like getting like five, six credit cards and everybody thinks I'm crazy, but you know, 10 years from now when she's 28 years old and she has six cards with 10 years of history, that's huge. That's now, right. now when she buys a car, she doesn't see a huge dip because most of her account is longevity. Yeah. And you know, like there's a statistic, something like eighty percent. Maybe it, maybe I'm even like, <laughs> maybe it's even low when I'm saying. But most like professional sports athletes, they they're broke after just a few years of, of leaving the leagues, yeah, right? Yeah, because they don't get that financial literacy training at all. No, they don't get it in high school. Spending too much money partying, right? And then cars. That lifestyle is good, right? So it yep. is lucrative being a salesperson in the home improvement industry. I know people personally. Not even being dealers, not even owning their own business, but working as a 1099, 250, 300. And those are not outlandish figures no. uh, at all. But then they up their lifestyle game and then they don't know how to actually manage that money. That is human nature. Right. Is to uh, you make more money, you spend more money. But, yeah. you know, I, I guess from a dealer standpoint, the thing that I always try to speak on is to make sure that you're setting aside the money for your marketing. Because as long as you're able to afford your marketing budget, you'll have leads coming in, you'll make more sales, and you'll have more money that you can spend. But if you don't put that money to the side, especially when you have seasonality in business, as most business does, um, then you're going to feel really tight in those uh, slower months. Right, right. And that's when you need your, your extra budget money. Yeah, I mean, the seasonality in the home improvement industry is real. Oh, it is, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I mean, I always describe it to everybody is like, you're just plan on losing money in December, right around the holidays. I mean, that's, it's kind of an investment time. Yeah. Right? I mean, unless you're like a retail business right. where you're making most of your money in those months, you know, the last two weeks of December, first two weeks of January, people are traveling or they're with family. You know, this past year with COVID was unique because there wasn't, and right. we saw less of a dip, but 
The dip's back this year. Yeah. Yep. It's it seems to be normalizing from where it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting industry to be in. I I would be remiss as a marketing company to try to understand and impart some wisdom on folks that don't have as much marketing resources. Is kind of what are your suggestions for you know newer folks to the industry to to try to drive some leads to their business and really do it in a scalable way. Well, word of mouth reviews is huge. Um, nowadays, everybody knows how to Google a business. I, I last night when you told me where we were going to eat dinner, I Googled it and you know wanted to see what the dinner recommendations were and things like that. So, um, having a strong presence online, you know, making your brand something that can be trusted, and um, I guess just treating every customer well so that you don't get negative reviews goes a long way, but. Yeah, I mean, coming down to doing the right marketing, it really just comes down to finding the right partners in the industry. Um, people that are reputable, they're out there and meeting with your end customer, understanding who your end customer is, um, going through the psychology of what they're going through in the buying process. Sometimes you kind of have to work the problem backwards in order to find the right solution. All right, that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, well, from one Dom to another. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming down and, and being with us here at the Build Better Podcast here in the Austin HQ. Yeah, I appreciate Modernize. you having me. This is great. Yes. Yeah, we'll have you back uh, soon, hopefully. Let's awesome. get all your dealers down here and let's do a uh, that's going to be fun jam pack podcast. So that's a great idea. We should have them all on the show. That would be wild, right? Yes, I know a couple of them that would be wild. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get some more folks on this side of the table for that side of the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll space it out a little bit. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks again, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Sounds great. Thank you.